Hello and welcome to Balancing the Ledger, where tech and finance intersect. I'm Robert Hackett. And I'm Jeff Roberts. And today we're here with Marco Santori, the President and Chief Legal Officer of Blockchain, the company, not the technology. Thanks for coming here, Marco. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So let's kick things off getting into the news of the week. Uh, first off, Binance, the world's biggest cryptocurrency exchange, just completed an acquisition. They bought a company called Trust Wallet, which uh, makes decentralized wallets, and it's also a decentralized app browser. Jeff, you actually spoke to CZ, who's the head of Binance, about this, and uh, he talked about how it's key to the future of their exchange. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, this guy's like years ahead, and I'm still trying to get my head around it, but he seemed to think the world's going to be decentralized and that these things are going to have a dual function of both storing your currency and navigating the future of the Internet. Yeah, and I should say the wallet that um, Binance bought was not a custodial wallet, right? Custodial wallets were a convenience that was, I think, very valuable over the last few years to a lot of people. Looking forward, custodial wallets can't do the things that non-custodial wallets can do. Some users feel safe giving their coins to a third party to hold on to, especially users in the Western world. Most of the world doesn't feel that way. Um, and a decentralized or a non-custodial wallet is one way to both keep control of your money yourself and also to position uh, yourself to be able to actually have a private key that allows you to interact with all these distributed applications. Let's switch gears and talk about SIM swapping, which is this new attack that's been going around. Actually, it's not very new, but it's been targeting cryptocurrency uh, holders for a while now. A hacker has just been indicted for uh, waging these attacks against people at Consensus, the biggest event uh, in the blockchain industry in New York. What is happening? How are people getting their funds stolen, and how can they protect themselves, Marco? Yeah, I, so I'm not a security specialist, but um, I dabble in common sense. I try. Most of the hacking that goes on is uh, a result of people relying on their, uh, on their telephone numbers as a credential, which is not the most secure way to go about it, A. And two, then giving their valuable possessions, their coins, to a third party to hold on for them. When you combine those two, you've given somebody else the authority to process a transaction on somebody else's behalf. And that's a, that's a dangerous thing. It's, it's something that um, we, we caution our users against. We offer two-factor validation, but you can do so using, using an app. Well, this sounds like a good segue into blockchain, which has been around for a long time. Tell us a little bit, how does it work? Someone who hasn't used their own private keys before. I mean, what do you use instead of authenticating with your phone number? Um, well, you can authenticate with an app. There's email-based authentication. There's all different varieties of authentication, ranging from very secure to very convenient. And we don't live in a perfect world, so we try to offer choice to our users. And that's really one of the theories that underpins um, the company's offering, offering that choice, putting the power of personal finance in people's hands instead of demanding that they give their power to a third party who holds on to their money for them. That's, that's the bank. But on a model. practical level, you still put in a password, is that right? That yeah. serves as your private keys? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you open a blockchain wallet, you go to a website. It's simple. It's blockchain.com. Um, go to the website, open up a free wallet, um, and what appears in front of you looks like every, every other wallet. It's just as easy and convenient as a custodial wallet but you keep the keys. You hold on to those keys. We never have custody of your funds, so you can have the very same Bitcoins in a blockchain wallet at the very same time as they're in any other industry standard wallet. You can spend the same Bitcoins, save the same Bitcoins, transact with the same Bitcoins, and it's not just Bitcoin either. It's Ether and Bitcoin Cash too, with more on the way. So blockchain sort of started off working with decentralized wallets. That was its major kind of uh, product. But it's also been getting into a bunch of other products lately. Can you tell us about some of those? Yeah, just, uh, just last month, we launched our institutional suite of products uh, called BPS, Blockchain Principal Strategies. Pretty straightforward. Head to blockchain.com slash BPS. Um, and you can sign up. Uh, it's an institutional product. We have been um, the leader in consumer wallets. That's where we've made a name for ourselves, built a level of trust worldwide uh, in the non-custodial consumer space. We're taking that same know-how, that same brand, and that same team and building an in a best-in-class um, institutional process. Tell us a little bit about how you got into crypto in the first place. We were talking backstage a little bit. You said that you, uh, uh, you actually argued a case that involved Bitcoin mining. <laughs> I did. I argued the very first uh, Bitcoin mining case in the Southern District of New York before a 90-year-old judge who was very smart. 
uh, and I have no doubt understood every details of the case. But after, <laughs> after an hour of arguing over whether as a matter of law Bitcoin was money or not, uh, took us back to chambers, looked, us, looked both lawyers straight in the eye with impatience and said, counsel, settle this case. He, wa he wanted nothing to do with it. Mark, well, you're kind of a well-known figure in the crypto world, in part because you're sort of, I think, the first crypto lawyer. And you were sort of uh, the one who promulgated the so-called SAFT agreement and kind of put out a, a model contract to help, you know, companies issue tokens and sell them eventually as securities and stay on the right side of the law. However, some say you might have been a little ahead of your time with that, and that was sort of, you know, you, you, were, you moved a bit too quickly. Um, how are you feeling now? Do you think you're right? Or what's the, the state of play in that world? Yeah, so the, the, the SAFT was uh, the Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. It's, it's become a, a market standard, especially on the west coast of the US. Um, and people have added things to it, SAFT plus equity, SAFT plus whatever it might be. But we didn't create the SAFT. When we first found it, it was um, a very simple instrument. And the team of lawyers uh, at Cooley, we looked at it, we reworked it into something we thought was better. Um, the SAFT project was a, a self-regulatory reaction to this rash of ICOs, these sales of pre-functional tokens to the public. Uh, we looked at that and we thought, we think there's something better. We think we can do better than an ICO. Um, and, and we did. Uh, we published the SAFT project white paper that essentially says, look, you can use this agreement, treat this agreement like a security, sell it only to accredited investors or go and register via Reg A plus or you know, do an IPO for the, for the agreement. Nobody did that, of course, but um, you could if you wanted to. But then, and this is, this is the important part, once the token is functional, once it does what the creator said it should do, at that point, the thing is really a consumer good. It's a, it's a functional device like, uh, or a functional thing like, like gold or bananas or wheat or other, uh, commodities. That was the fundamental innovation in the SAFT framework. It's it stopped doing ICOs, essentially. Um, and we saw the SEC uh, have a similar reaction to ICOs, saying, look, this is, this is just not right. Most of these things are sales of securities. Um, and when we published the white paper, there were people who supported it and lauded it. They said, this is, this is, this is the best thing for crypto since sliced bread. And then there were other people who said, well, there's some real risks here. And frankly, Personally, I agree with people on both sides. We identified some real risks. Um, but uh, most recently, I think sort of the punchline to all of this is that just last month, Bill Hinman, the uh, head of uh, the Division of Corporation Finance at SEC, in fact said, look, if your tokens are pre-functional, that's a pretty good indicator that they're a security. And he also said that some tokens could change from security when they're pre-functional to a non-security. When they, when they are functional. So I, we I view that as a validation too, yeah. process. Hinman, the NEC, SEC official, said, was referring to these that are sort of in a gray area, and he referred to the how much activity of third parties is supporting them, and the less, yeah. the more decentralized they are, the more likely it's gonna not be a security, i.e. Ethereum. I had the feeling he was talking about XRP. Did you get that feeling too? <laughs> no, so I didn't. No? I didn't get that feeling. I, I, uh, I, I have great respect for the, for the people at R Ripple. Um, I'll, I'll say that what, what Hinman did, and this was of course not the official position of the SEC, but he's an important guy there. Uh, he said, look, what the SAFT project said is, is the line, the dividing line, functionality. It's close, but it's not the whole dividing line. There's more to it. It's functionality plus a few other factors, and we call all of that decentralization. The big factor in decentralization is how many people have these tokens in their hands, how many people are using them. We think that's something that we're pretty well positioned um, to facilitate at blockchain. Well, applying that test to where does XRP fit? Is it a security or not? Oh, I, w I, w I won't opine on uh, whether a particular token is a, is, is, is a security or not, but I will say that XRP uh, has demonstrable functional use. At the same time, Ripple uh, or its sister companies, its, its affiliates have, have also advertised it um, in ways that, well, in a whole variety of ways. So it's a question really of weighing. This is a facts and circumstances based analysis. So if you, if you listen to what Bill Hinman said, he said, look, here, here are all these factors that could weigh in favor of security status. He says, but Ether is not a security. If you look at the Ethereum crowd sale, there's a lot of those factors present. Was that a security? Who knows? It's a facts, it's a facts and circumstances analysis. So if I had to fault uh, the current status quo for anything, it's that it's there's still a little bit of a question mark in the air around what is and is not a security, but we do know that a big factor of it is, well, 
exactly what we said it was in our white paper, functionality. Reading the tea leaves, what do you think is going to be the next major sort of legal action that comes down or next sort of decision or clarification that happens from the regulatory uh, authorities in the crypto world? I, uh, I got to tell you, I think that most people are expecting some big pronouncement from, uh, from the SEC or some big pronouncement from the CFTC or some federal regulator. I don't think that's the way it's going to go down. I think that the very first things we're going to start seeing are uh, civil lawsuits, civil suits. We're going to see decisions in private litigations where um, somebody, some plaintiff, maybe a class action plaintiff, is suing uh, a purported issuer. And that's going to result in decisions, binding precedent in some jurisdictions. And that may be where we get our law. That may be where uh, the, the, what, what draws the line between security and non-security. It may not be SEC. It may not, it, may not, it may not, in fact, be the regulators tasked with making that decision because, after all, we're all beholden to the courts. And where specifically is Are you referring to that state court action in California, or is there a more prevalent one that's... Uh... There are a number of actions right now. I mean, dozens and dozens of them, um, some against the major U.S. exchanges uh, that are full-on class action suits that could be um, catastrophic for some of those exchanges if they were in fact found to be doing whatever they al allege to be doing. But one of the things the court has to decide before getting to those questions is what law applies? Is it securities law? Is it the law of commodities, just common law fraud? Um, since that's one of the first questions that has to be answered, I think we all might be surprised to see that the first federal pronouncement on this issue doesn't come from the regulators. It comes from one of these major lawsuits. That's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for being on the show, Marco. Thanks for having me. I'm Robert Hackett. And I'm Jeff Roberts. For more Balancing Ledger, please go to fortune.com. See you next time. Yeah.